Okay, now that that lovely plane has passed, I am going to share with you guys a little bit of history here. This is called Tudor Hall. Tudor Hall is home of Francis Scott Key. Now who that was, that was the man that wrote the Star Spangled Banner. He said that he could see the battle from where he was and came up with the words. Now this place gets more foot traffic around the start of the school year for the kids. All that good stuff. You've got a little widow's peak on top. And some very, very old trees. Now imagine this looked much different. Back in the day, he had a clear view all the way down to the waterfront right by where there is a wharf. It's where all the trade ships and everything came in. It's just a street over. But that is part of where the street is. That was part of the view. Nothing but water. So we have the grounds. Now this is open to the public for the most part. I mean, you can come onto the property and walk around and all that good stuff. And I will take you through into the little plaques so that you can see what it says and I can read them to you. But this was considered to be quite grand back in the day. I mean, it's huge even by our standards now. Most of it is original. All the original old brickwork, leaded glass, old school drains. But you can look and see all this original stuff. The brick, I mean, the door is tiny just by your traditional stance. I mean, it's not quite a full arm length wide, but it's still pretty small. And that is where it is, Tudor Hall. If you want to look into it on your own, check out the website. Email info at stmaryshistory.org. This is a pretty awesome piece of history to live by. And now here we go. Tudor Hall is now the St. Mary's County Memorial Library on the National Register of Historical Places, restored by St. Mary's County and the United States Government, 1970 to 1972. Whole bunch of county people here put in with that. Now we have, this is another plaque. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see a little bit better. Tudor Hall, formerly Americus Felix Secundus, built by Abraham Barnes in 1750, extensively enlarged by Philip Key in 1796 is now dedicated to all the citizens of St. Mary's County as a free library, gift of Mary Patterson Davidson, 1950, in memory of those who gave their lives for the country, 1914 through 1918, 1941 through 45. World War I, you have quite a few, let me zoom it out a little bit. World War I, 
all of the county folk. Lots of very still around county names. Briscoe, Biscoe, Dorsey, Goddard, Thompson, Swan, Somerville, Norris, Long, and then World War II. Quite a bit more. Abel's, Brown's, Bush, Clark, Downs, Ennis, Ennels, Gatton, that's a big county name, Goldsboro, Hill, Higgs, Hayden, Wathen, Wheeler, Pilkerton, Owens, Moore, Mattingly is a big one in this county. It's just a little bit of our history. Now there are, if anybody is interested, you can look it up, I believe it's online still, what's called bicentennial trees that we have in the county. And there are, I think, about four or five of them left still. But the county trees, these were around back when uh, we had the, I think it was the bicentennial and they're still around so technically you're a little bit past the bicentennial era that's some of the replacement work and the restoration and now this is the front of the house I'll scooch away from it so you can see it a little bit better didn't quite get it all in this shot. I love that widow's peak. So beautiful. But yeah, we're uh, right here on the Patuxent River in the Potomac where quite a bit of the fighting went down between the British ships in the War of 1812 and then even in the Civil War a little time dial I love these, these are so cool that's how they could tell what time of day it was by their little sundials we had the little bench. They would quite often come and sit. Had little parties and around here you use oyster shells for a lot of your walkway stuff. Okay. So hopefully I can do this justice without too many fumbles. War comes to Breton Bay. In 1812, our young nation went to war against what was then the mightiest sea power on earth, Great Britain. It's been suggested that what Americans call the War of 1812 was instead the American theater of the very first world war when France and the United States challenged British supremacy on the high seas and worldwide. One of the first military actions taken by the British was to blockade the Chesapeake Bay. From huge warships, British raiding parties came ashore by barges to secure supplies and terrify the population. They also lured several thousand free and enslaved African Americans to join the British forces. State and local militias attempted to protect residences and towns and also to quell the slave uprisings that the British sought to provoke. Upon the invaders' arrival, local militia would flee to the woods, being outnumbered by the vastly over overpowered by the British. No harm was to be done of the wives and servants and slaves did not resist their taking of supplies and tobacco. However, 
There are numerous examples of homes and courthouses burned by the British throughout the Tidelands. Miss Elizabeth M. Key of Tudor Hall and Mrs. Thompson saved the Leonardtown Courthouse by telling the British that it was used as a house of worship. And that is the rendering of what's pretty still accurate even to this day of the area and there you have St. Mary's all of this is St. Mary's County that's Calvert County all of that is Charles up that way and then PG County and then there is DC right there now it says, the Key family renovated Tudor Hall to the popular Georgian style between 1810 and 1817. They added a full second story with eight bedrooms. The symmetrical wings of the unusual inset portico included a ballroom and a beautiful hanging staircase in the central hall. The exterior finish was made to resemble limestone blocks Restoration in the 20th century revealed the brick detailing seen today. All that awesomeness. And back then you had four chimneys everywhere. Now that's something I'd like to do with you guys if you don't mind. It's a little bit out of my channel's intent, but history is history and I like history. So hopefully you guys enjoy the ride along with me. Built on land granted in 1649 to Bertram and Dominic Obert, this pleasant Georgian building has been home to successive generations of contributors to Leonardtown history. The property, first known as part of Little St. Lawrence, came into ownership of Philip Lyons. Lyons called the tract Shepherd's Old Fields. And in 1708, the assembly, of which he was a member, endorsed a petition that the town and county courthouse be erected at this most convenient place. That ended up being the county's logo, or at least the town's logo. In 1744, Abraham Barnes is documented to be the owner of the house located on the lands which he named America Felis Secundus. Barnes was a successful ship owner, planter, and public servant who served as a delegate to the Assembly and to the Albany Congress. The Barnes family occupied the house from the late 1760s to 1817. In 1798, then owned by Abraham's son Richard, the house was described as a dwelling house of wood 46 by 22 feet. An addition of the brick to each end with separate kitchen and storehouses where Richard Barnes died in 1804. His will freed several hundred slaves three years after my death and stipulated that they were to take the names Barnes. The name continues in St. Mary's County today through descendants and these slaves. This is very true. I went to school with quite a few Barneses. In 1817, the property was purchased by Philip Key. It is his connection to the Tudor royalty that the name was derived. The Star Spangled Banner, the poem that became our national anthem, was written by Philip's cousin, Francis Scott Key. It was the Key family who transformed the house into the structure we see today. Joseph Harris Key, who died in 1917, was the last Key to reside at Tudor Hall. Through the generosity of Mary Patterson Davidson, the house was purchased in 1947 and restored to function as a public library dedicated to those who gave their lives in World Wars I and II. And in 1984, this lovely place was purchased by the St. Mary's County Historical Society. And that is it. So right now, I'm going to do a little lap real quick so that you guys can see it again. And then I'll stop over at the old jail. That's kind of a trip. They have an actual cannon out front, but just imagine how cool it would have been back in the day 
even now, to be able to have something this big and to look out and be able to have nothing but the water at your feet. So, I'll be back in just a minute. Okay. Sorry for the brief intermission. This is the old jailhouse out here. Very cool. I can remember as a little kid being absolutely amazed by this bad boy. Straight out of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Very old. Now, let me gingerly get through this flower bed here. Okay. Cannon was brought to Maryland in 19, excuse me, 1634 on the Ark. Used in defense of St. Mary's city and as a St. Indigo's Manor boundary marker. Presented the St. Mary's County Historical Society by the Society of Jesus. This is the old jail. Very cool. The original bars. It's wild. Okay. Leonardtown. Spies, intriguers, and blockade runners. When the white citizens of St. Mary's County voted here in 1860, presidential election, John Breckenridge, the secessionist candidate who carried Maryland, got 920 votes. Abraham Lincoln received 9% of the popular Maryland vote. The only man to have voted for him here was waylaid on his home. On April 23, 1861, in a public meeting here, citizens declared allegiance to the South and resolved to raise $10,000 for weapons and ammunition. The old port town teemed with spies, intriguers, and blockade runners. During the summer of 1861, U.S. naval forces landed here and searched house to house. The Union troops occupied the courthouse and camped nearby in the sheep pen woods. Locals arrested for suspected disloyalty were imprisoned at the Point Lookout. That's another trip we'll take. Authorities closed the beacon and jailed its editor to stem its secessionist commentary. After the war, which devastated the local economy, many residents moved west. Now this is a comment. When mail arrived in our village on Monday night, bringing the intelligence that Fort Sumter had fallen, the wildest enthusiasm broke forth among our people, and the huzzers and congratulations and rejoicings were the order of the hour. It indicates that most unmistakable manner that the sympathies of our people are exclusively with the South. St. Mary's Beacon, April 18, 1861. It says local U.S. Congressman Benjamin Gwen Harris, who gave impassioned speeches favoring recognition of the Confederacy, is the only representative ever convicted of treason. Days after President Abraham Lincoln's assassination, Harris was arrested for giving money to two Confederate soldiers on their way home, tried and imprisoned. President Andrew Johnson later ordered his release. So that is it guys, that's just a small little piece of the history that is my neck of the woods.
I think it's really cool. Just to be a little history geek and enjoy something that's just here. So, yeah. Until next time. Maybe we'll do Point Lookout next. That's an actual Civil War field hospital, lighthouse, and a little Civil War bunker. So, love you guys. Until next time, keep looking up. That's the truth, y'all. Yeah.